On Friday, March 31st, eight of us came from CVUF, came together in a tiny desert town near the Mexican border in Arizona called Amado. And it's near Green Valley, which is right there. And we spent time down in Nogales and over there along the border and up in Tucson. We were gathered there for our annual Unitarian Universalist Pacific Southwest District Assembly, a coming together of ministers and members from 14 Arizona congregations, 38 Californian congregations, and one from Nevada to explore Unitarian Universalism in a wider context. In this case, the Baja Four, as they were called, which are two congregations in Tucson, one in Sierra Vista, and the congregation in Amado Green Valley, were co-facilitating the District Assembly, or DA, as it's most often referred to. Normally located in one congregation only, this DA had participants spread out among all four congregations. We joined for worship and business meetings virtually by live streaming, and it actually worked out really well to the organizers' delight. The idea was that we would all go on immersion experiences in the different areas to gain a deeper understanding of the border, of immigration, of racism, of class and economic issues. It was a transformative time for all of us, which you're going to hear about shortly. On the first evening, our board president, Tom, and I dined at the Cow Palace. That's Tom there in the shadows, in a leather jacket and soft-soled shoes, looking like he ate cow there every Friday night. <laughs> the Cow Palace in Amado was an iconic local restaurant that looked like a giant cow shed. It was famous for all the meat-loving movie stars who ate there, like John Wayne. For me, a vegetarian, it was a very odd place indeed, stumbled upon as a last resort when no other restaurants that Tom and I tried to go to were available at 5.30. In fact, it's a, it's a retirement community, so they were all busy at 5.30. <laughs> Hence, we ended up there. And I was greeted with no small amount of laughter from the waitress as I asked what their vegetarian options might look like. I was told they would look like french fries and potato skins. <laughs> I went for the potato skins. As it turns out, I was the only vegetarian that had ever graced their doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'd already been in Tucson and Aravaca, which is a small town near Amado, with the other UU ministers for two days and had witnessed the heartless Operation Streamline at the Tucson courthouse. Thirty migrants who had been captured within the last week were brought before the magistrate with hands, waist, and feet bound in chains. They were swiftly sentenced to one to six months of jail time with their deportation ensured after that. These were hopeful young men and women who had risked their lives coming across the brutal desert from Central America or Mexico, hoping for a better life in the U.S. Upon capture, they were stripped of all their belongings, treated like criminals, imprisoned, and eventually dumped somewhere in Mexico with nothing, none of their belongings, and maybe not even in a town that they were familiar with. Their hopes and dreams for a better future were dashed. Some had attempted this journey several times and received longer sentences as a punishment. We could only begin to imagine their stories. Operation Streamline ensured they were not treated as individuals, but rather sentenced and deported in much the same way we treat animals in factory farms. Along the way, we met brave humanitarian workers, some of whom are members of the Amado congregation. They put signs that you'll see shortly, like this one, 
in their driveways and windows so that they could quietly help starving migrants with water or food. And they literally would put the signs out there so that Border Patrol would not come into their homes in the middle of the evening if a desperate migrant showed up at their doorstep and they were giving them food or water. Here are a few more of the stories that we encountered during our time. I'm David Barker. During my recent trip to Nogales, Arizona, and then on to Nogales, Sonora, Me Mexico, as part of Pacific PSWD Justice DA, I, real I was amazed at how little I knew about our Mexican border wall. In ambos Nogales, there has been some sort of fence or wall since the early 1900s. Before the 1990s, the fence was merely a chain link fence that allowed farmers, workers, and families to come and go without much concern. In 1994, Bill Clinton delivered his Berlin is free speech, praising the fall of the Berlin Wall. Contrast that with the fact that that same year, his administration authorized replacement of the chain link fence in Nogales with an eight to 12 foot wall made from surplus Vietnam War era landing mats. Again, in 2011, 2.8 miles of the solid landing mat fence was replaced with a taller, deeper, 18 to 30 foot bollard style fence at a cost of $11.8 million. People could see and reach through the wall while US agents could monitor activity on the Mexican side of the wall. The wall is good at stopping the normal migrations of wildlife, thus disrupting the ecology. It stops the normal flow of water, sometimes causing flooding in Nogales, Sonora. The wall does not stop people. It merely slows them down, sometimes by as little as 18 seconds, on average only five minutes. The border between the US and Mexico is about 2,000 miles long. Over, 16, over 650 miles of fence, pedestrian wall, or vehicle wall already exist without the current administration's fingerprints. The current administration proposes 1,000 miles of wall with estimates ranging from 10 to $70 billion. Usually, where the wall does not exist, the terrain and environment are considered to be sufficient deterrent to keep people from crossing. I know these few words only touch on a much larger conversation that could be had about the border wall. Perhaps that conversation could start with the words from the sign I saw in a garden at the Hepac Community Center in Nogales. Las fronteras nos dividen, pero la tierra nos une. The borders divide us, but the land unites us. I'm Matthew Wiseman. Four of us took two leisurely days to drive the 563 miles from Thousand Oaks to Amato, Arizona. At our destination, the Unitarian Universalist congregation at Green Valley, Reverend Crary graciously welcomed us, but we were a couple of hours early, most likely in everybody's way, so someone suggested we look at the quilt exhibit in the other room. On the walls were 10 quilts created since 2007 by the Migrant Quilt Project, stitched from scraps of clothing left behind at layup sites, designated areas where migrants can rest, change their clothes, and drink water before moving on. The quilts honor the names of the many who have died while attempting to cross the brutal 70-mile desert in the Tucson border sector. Each quilt represents one year. Each scrap on the quilt has names of the people who have died. Many of the remains cannot be identified. Designated as unknown, Los Desconocidos. As we pass each quilt, there are many names, but many more unknowns. Desconocida. Desconocido, 
Des Godot of Sida. <laughs> There's lots of data. You can find it on the internet. Charts tracking the RHR recovered human remains versus the number of migrants caught by the government ratios, predictions, but only one statistic really matters. In the Tucson sector alone, more than 2,800 people have died this way since 2001. In the broader area along the border between Texas and California, that number is over 6,000. The causes of deaths are obscured by time. Some were clearly from violence, most succumbing to the elements lost in the desert. There are thousands of square miles east to west, but only 70 miles of desert from the border to Tucson. On one square, on one of the quilts, a man, a desconocido, they found a notebook with him, they found a notebook with him and a handwritten message, perhaps it was a poem. I love you so very much, my dear. The days with you are happy days. Always keep me in your mind because we will be together in person. I love you very much, my dear. Dream of me. Walking numbly around the room, gazing at the quilts, I now understand why we travel to Arizona. Soon after leaving the trail, we came upon the second barbed wire fence. We took turns stepping down on it near a broken post so others could step over. As we pressed on down the dry creek bed, we found more cans, some fresh, some rusted, more clothing, socks worn to shreds, a torn sweater, a torn emergency blanket. Suddenly I saw the first bottle of water, then the first full food and water drop. When I stepped forward to take a picture, I saw the writing. God and the Virgin of Guadalupe are always with you. Have faith in them, because they will always be with you. You are important, strong, and brave. Suddenly, hot tears rolled down my face. And I thought about my student Maria's mother, who was deported in the night when Maria was a ninth grader. Three months later, she crossed the desert to be in Los Angeles with her children. I hoped more than anything she had come across a bottle like this to let her know she is loved. By her, by her family and by strangers. Then we scaled a 12-foot rock and hiked on to the shrine. No one is sure who started it, but migrants bring candles, rosaries, and prayer cards. No more deaths brings water, food, hope, and love. As I sat in the shade before it, eating a prepackaged salad and sipping fresh water, I thought about Gabby, who crossed the desert at 13 with her family for a better life in Los Angeles. Had she found shelter when she was plagued by fear and thirst and hunger crossing the desert in the night? Dozens of faces of children and parents I know who have made this journey swam before my eyes. Before we left, I wrote my love on a bottle in hopes it warms the heart of someone I will likely never meet on their difficult and dangerous journey home. I'm Tom Wolfe. The closing event of Justice Weekend was a Sunday morning service right at the wall in Nogales. There's a Nogales, Arizona, in the United States, and a Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. The wall, which I did not realize you could be able to see through, essentially cuts a community in half. Everyone attending was separated into small groups of eight to 10 people. And after an initial part of the service, we then walked silently up a road 
just a few arm lengths away from the wall. When we reached a crest at top of a hill, we stopped, and in those small groups, we read and reacted to one of two short real-life vignettes. The one my group read about was a girl in Santa Ana, a daughter of undocumented immigrants, and herself a US citizen. As she related what happened to her hardworking father, who went into hiding because he was sought by the immigration police, then de and then deported when she was only 13, was heartbreaking. Her family's misery continued with a botched second border crossing, the result of which was her mother returning to Mexico to be with Jasmine's broken and depressed father. At age 13, Jasmine is given a Sophie's choice. Stay in the US, continue schooling and your opportunities, or go with your parents to a country virtually unknown to her. She writes, I chose to stay. It has now been almost four years and they have missed holidays, birthdays, and the birth of grandchildren. I am an honor student in the 11th grade and an AP student. My parents have 10 years before they are able to come back. They will probably not be there for my graduation, which they have been my inspiration to finish. The destruction of this family's life is a horror that you don't really understand from reading a newspaper or watching CNN. It's the intimate truth of a system which needs our attention and a view of an underclass of American families that drastically need our support. My heart, was <clears throat> my heart was broke open that very first start of our journey as we were crossing the border into Mexico. There was a sign that said, U.S. Customs Border Protection. We were told by our guide that the white building next to us was where they were dropped off, often in the night and with very little with them, not even maybe a phone to contact someone for a pickup. And that day, a boy, a young boy, was being walked across by two American officers, La Migra, they were called, walking slowly on either side of him. He was being escorted through the tunnel right next to us. I was, he was met by a Mexican border patrol officer for the handoff. It was a solemn swap, a, wa a cold walk into the arms of, the, of a warm heart. The Mexican officer put his arms around the youth, and with their heads down, they walked and walked. And I wondered, what words were they exchanging? Together, they just walked. I wondered where he would go and who would meet him on this side. I'll never know. What I do know is that his walk was alone. His journey to freedom was short-lived. I prayed for him and for all those crossing both ways. Our excursion was led by Emrys, a seminary student and courageous, passionate activist with a humanitarian group, No More Deaths. <clears throat> Among their activities, volunteers hike the trails and leave water, food, socks, blankets and other supplies for the immigrants crossing the desert. Under the direction of their medical team, they provide emergency first aid treatment to individuals in distress. We learned that providing assistance, though strongly discouraged by border control, is indeed legal, unless you transport someone in a car or a truck. Emrys was cited for littering, leaving water in the desert for those travelers. This was considered a felony and took two years of battle before it was thrown out of court. He shared many stories of the complexity of life in the desert borderlands. I was struck by the tales of two men who had chosen the profession of being border patrol. 
One, a Mexican-American who was born in the U.S. to undocumented parents, took the job because it paid $60,000 a year. Nothing in the area could compare to that wage. During the day, he would search for people crossing the border illegally and arrest and detain them. At night, he would come home to his undocumented parents, day in and day out. The other was the story of a white US-born citizen who really didn't think twice when his Mexican best friend and his family were yanked out of school and deported when the boys were seven. He went on to get a job as border patrol, and it wasn't until they were out in the desert and came across a starving nine-year-old girl to whom they gave water that he understood what he signed up to do. He resigned the next day. On September 19th, 2005, a baby boy was born and died on the side of the Aravaca Road. I close with an excerpt of a poem we found at the site marking his death. This poem represents the many unanswered questions about a population that suffers and is silenced. It was written by a humanitarian worker, Marie Vogel Gary. No matter how many times I ask, you do not answer my question. You leave me only with this. 10 years ago, you birthed a baby along an Arizona roadside. What created this child? Love or rape? I asked, did you leave for a better life for both of you? More safety, less dirt floors, broken glass, hunger, move north, no money, take a chance, start a long promise, money later, start with a lover, no promise. You do not answer my questions. No matter how many times I ask, you do not answer. Instead, you walk, walk. Walk, thirst, hunger, tire, walk farther, no birds, no shade, no water. Drink your urine, your body rebels, you fall, struggle, now alone, now always alone. No matter how many times I ask, did the road look like a good place? Maybe help, maybe water? Had the pains begun faster and faster? Did you stop, lie down, try not to scream? No matter how many times I ask, you cannot answer. Did you hold this bundle of death, weep and tell about the life that might have happened? Work, play, School, laughter, ice cream, toys, baseball. Did you share this under the stars that night when there were no angels, no shepherds or magi? Only endless dark silence, the smell of blood and death. What I took away from our time in Arizona was that although I may not be able to change national immigration policies, I can support a more humane approach to immigration and natural migration, an approach that does not rip families apart and risk people's lives, an approach that honors globalism, an approach that seeks to remind our militarized system that these are people with worth and dignity who are mostly trying to create better lives for themselves and their families 
or indeed are fleeing terrible violence in their home country. These are people who, like all people, need and deserve compassion and kindness, as well as hope. May we all be people offering hope and compassion to other people. May it be so.